Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Right back toward the hole. How about in? That's the second eagle he's made it for this week. <laughs> 17 years later, Hal Sutton is the players' champion. Hey everybody, welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. Hal, just got back from Pinehurst. How, how, how was your trip? Uh, it was good. You know, it'd been, uh, I was at, actually at CCNC, Country okay, Club gotcha. in North Carolina, and that's where I won the U.S. Amateur 41 years ago. I had not been back in 41 years, and uh, they just redid the golf course, uh, made a few tweaks. It's got the U.S. Junior Amateur there in two weeks, and um uh, I'm sure the golf course will fare well, but sure. these kids are still good. <laughs> they are good. There's, that's kind of a golf mecca. Obviously, you've got Pinehurst. There's another course that's that's escaping my memory, but it's where they're holding the U.S. Women's Open next year. Yeah, I Pine Needles. Pine Needles. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Pine Needles. And yeah. It's right there too. And yeah, that's Pat McGowan and Bonnie and and uh, the the whole. Uh, Peggy Kirk Bell family. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, actually they sat at the table with me at the dinner that okay. night. Nice. So, you know, the USGA was there at the dinner. Webb Simpson was there. It was, it was really quite an ordeal and, uh, it was good to relive those memories. Do you guys have any, with USGA being there, do you have any interesting discussions? Any, uh, any the USGA, yeah, we talked about uh, Jim Dotson was the narrator for the event, and he asked Webb and I both what uh, we thought needed to be done for the future so that golf courses stayed, uh, you know, not important. Obsolete. Yeah, not obsolete. And uh, I said make the ball spin more, and Webb agreed with it. You know, he wanted to – he said – have people curve the ball besides uh, Bubba Watson. You know, he said most people don't curve the ball out there. Yeah. And we see that all the time in here, too. Yeah. Did you, back in your day, did you curve it that much? I didn't yeah. curve it that much, but when I say spin, I didn't, I wanted to be able to control yeah. this part. Right. It wasn't always coming out you know, of the well, same. You know, one of the things that I asked Webb Simpson, I asked him, I said, you know, for all the people out there listening, you don't realize how, if you have to lay up on 15 at Augusta, <laughs> how hard that third shot is. Yeah. Because trying to keep it out of the water with the spin and everything else, they made that shot easier with the ball the way it is now. Yep. And, you know, I can remember that there was like a one-foot area that I felt like I had to land the ball that would keep it on the green in a decent area without it spinning back sure. and, into the water. And now, you know, and, and the last two Masters have been a little bit different, but I remember in the fall a lot of balls were stopping there. And yeah. That's probably because the grass was a little different than normal. Yeah. But I still remember a couple this year where the ball was stopping. And, you know, with, with a ballada ball or even the professionals or the prestigious, the, the stratas, that yeah. ball's zipping off. And yeah, has there no was chance. no stopping. That's right. I, I, I joke all the time with, with some of the guys in here. I, I still kind of miss that shot. I miss not not in that situation, spinning off the green in the I was going to say. <laughs> not, not there. Not there. I don't. I don't miss that shot. But I, I miss the 50, 60 yard little low spinner that we could hit. Like we had so much fun landing a ball in the front of the green, bouncing it back and spinning it back. Like yeah. that shot just popped straight up in the air. Well, that was one of the most. Uh, often question that i got how do you spin it how do you spin it how do you make it back up how do you make it back up and it's like i don't want it to do that that much no. i want it to hit and stop wherever it is that's what all the good players at my club when i was a young kid they all said the same thing i'm like no i want to see that thing suck back yeah. it's so cool it's so yeah. neat to hit that shot now when people ask i say it doesn't exist it doesn't yeah. it's hard to you know you can't spin it back unless Grooves are brand new, and the, the greens are super fast. The course has to be favorable to that. It's yeah. not just skill that causes that. That's exactly right. 
We uh, we have a uh, a very smart guest on for this week and a good friend of yours, Mr. Phil Blackmore. Yeah, Phil Blackmore. I've wanted him on for a while. I think uh, he's he's a deep thinker. He's a smart thinker. He is, you know, as he commentates out there, he says things that might be above most guys' head. I mean, he's he's really saying it from a player's perspective. And you know, for guests on here, he's opinionated too. He's not afraid to 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 go out there into the into the woods a little bit and, no, and make he, his point known. He he's not afraid to say what he thinks. Yep. And you know, I think you know, after we got through, he texted me, you know, and said, "Hey, open your voice up. Be heard." And uh, he knows that I have opinions, but I'm not as ready to get my opinions out there as Phil is. Yeah, <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, it was it was a great uh, great episode one. We're going to end up doing this in two episodes. It went a little bit longer than so we we separated them out. But you guys enjoy Phil Blackmar episode one. Hey everybody, welcome to another Be the Right Club Today podcast. I have a special guest on the podcast this week, Mr. Phil Blackmar. Phil won three times on the PJ Tour, a couple times on the Champions Tour. His three wins on the PJ Tour are rather interesting because they were all in playoffs. His last win being here locally in in Houston at the Shell Houston Open. Phil, welcome, welcome aboard. Chase, thanks. You missed the most important part of those playoffs. I birdied the first hole all three times to win. Interesting. Make it even better. That went farther back than Google would allow me to go. So that's uh, uh, that's a that's an even better stat. Uh, tell us, tell the, our uh, our audience at home what you've been up to. Yeah, I, this year I haven't been so busy doing television, so I've been doing some fly casting. I've really gotten into fly casting. It's very similar to the golf swing, really, because it's predicated on timing and sequence, and and I've become obsessed with that and, and fly fishing and tying flies in saltwater. I do saltwater fly fishing, and yeah, you know, I've stayed involved in the game and working with some guys, a little teaching and. A few things here and there, but uh, this week I'm actually at the John Deere Classic up in the Quad Cities in Iowa. And hope to see some really good golf. Awesome. So, talk briefly about uh, you and and Hal's experiences experiences together on the PJ Tour. Do you guys play often? We played quite a bit. We played some practice rounds. We go we go way back to to mini tour days. In fact, at uh, Q School at Waterwood, in I think '81 or something, the final round, I hit a a flying seven iron on the, on the 13th hole that flew the green over the next tee that was right behind the green out into Lake Livingston. And Hal happened to be, he and Joey Rassett and another player were on the next tee. And I got to go up and say, hey, do you guys see where that one went? They said, yeah, right out there in the lake. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> well, you've got a good memory. I didn't even remember that, Phil. I remember some things. <laughs> uh, hey, listen, I was standing on that tee worried about that next shot on 14. Because, you know, it all rested on that next shot on 14. Well, what a hole, too. Surrounded by water, cliff on the right, two iron that day we were hitting, and a driving rain. That was yeah. a heck of a hole. Yes, it was. So, Phil, three playoffs, won all three of them with a birdie. What kind of mindset did you use to do that? I'm just curious. You know, I don't know if we have enough time in this podcast, but the, the short version is that when I was at Texas, Coach Hannon had two Olympic swimmers come work with us on developing the art of relaxed concentration. For most people, when they concentrate, concentrate synonymous with trying hard, more effort. When they put more effort into it, they tighten up a little bit. When they tighten up, when you tighten up, your muscles don't stretch, your swing time, your timing changes because your muscles don't stretch the same and you end up hitting it poorly. It's so an oxymoron is relaxed concentration where you concentrate harder, but relax more at the same time. And they taught us that skill. And I took that and I had a program that I, that I developed using that. It's a breathing exercise based thing with relaxation component. I added visualization. I added music and a lot of things and had this program to deal with pressure. Unfortunately, I didn't come up with any frustration because the frustration is what really got me. But uh, I always felt like I wasn't as good as guys like you. I didn't hit as good as you. But I felt like if I could get to where we had five or six holes to go, I wasn't afraid to look you in the eye and say, all right, big boy, let's go. And you had that same attitude. You were the same way. And I don't know if you developed it or not or if it just came natural. But I remember playing with you and the look you had in the eye and your body language and everything about you. And BC Open that year, and you shot 60 round, 61 the fourth round. You had that look. You carried yourself that way, the way great champions do. Well, did you? Well, did, I ahead. think uh, 
I was determined, you know, and somehow I stayed relaxed enough. You know, my dad always put a lot of, I, I say this, he put a lot of pressure on me to perform, you know, when I was young. So I had a lot of try in me and I guess somehow I didn't tighten up to the point that it hurt me, but. Well, there's, it's, a, it's you, you did it wonderfully. You were great doing it and your ball striking carried you for me. It was more my distance and my short game. Um, but I struggled with my ball striking, but it's possible. I'll tell you a little story here. I had a buddy who was an F4 pilot during Vietnam. He ended up, he was a very good golfer. He flew for Continental after the Navy. And then he went, uh, he played senior mini tours over in Europe. And he was at my dad's house one day and he went by and, and uh, he was there and he said, man, I've been putting very good. And I asked him a question. I said, you mind if I ask you something? He said, no. I said, when you're flying your F4, you're going to land your F4 on the carrier in 25 foot seas at night at war all right so that means the carrier is dark there's no lights on it the deck is pitching up and down in these waves i said were you nervous and he looked at me and his voice goes up like damn right i was nervous it's the hardest thing to do there is in this world and if you screw up people will die i said okay you're nervous i said were you concentrating hard well sure it's concentrating hard i had the ball i had to call the ball i had my glide slope my attack angle i had my fuel my speed sure i hope i'm constantly going over all these gauges i said okay i said so you were you were nervous and you're trying really hard yeah i said how tight are you holding the stick well you can't hold the stick tight you can't fly the airplane and i looked at him and i asked him again then finally the third time he goes oh i see what you're saying i said where did you learn to do that he said, I don't know. I could always do it. I said, really? I said, you don't think those hundreds or thousands of hours you spent in a simulator or the hundreds or thousands of hours you spent at night in bed visualizing these different situations and going through the procedures over and over and over until that, that situation just became second nature to you? You don't think that played a role? Well, yeah, now that you mention it like that, sure it did. What have you done for your putting lately? Not a damn thing. <laughs> So my my question to both of you guys on this this topic is, you know, how do we train it? And is it just the hours upon hours of beating Jack Nicholas and beating Tiger Woods when you're young kids growing up? Is it I always felt like and, and what I tell a lot of the players that come through here is you almost you just have to live it. You have to get in there and do it again. Now, obviously, it's not life or death, like fi flying a fighter jet into, you know, onto an aircraft carrier. But you got to get in the heat and feel it. And most of the time you're going to fail the first couple of times and you got to, you got to go reassess and figure out how you're going to stick to the process and not be results oriented and be better next time. But how did you guys, how do you feel like you guys train for that moment to not, for it not to be overwhelming? Al, why don't you go first? Well, I think you just said it. You got a feel of it. You know, every, there wasn't a single time that I was prepared for it the first time. You know, I got more prepared for it the second time than I did the first time. And, uh, you know, you prepare to hit a shot or you prepare to make a putt and you know what you have to do to do that. But you have never prepared with pressure on you like that. So, you know, you just got a feel of it first, I think. And and then adjust. You got to ask yourself questions. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? How do I do that again? Take over, Phil. I, I think that's marvelous. I love the asking questions part. I don't think we ask enough questions these days. But there's always, if you listen to people, there's always something in the background, people that are really good at it, like you were, uh, that you don't, that you look over. And uh, your dad, your dad was constantly putting pressure on you from the time you were how old to play really good golf. And so you were accustomed to having pressure on you. Because if you play poorly, you're going to have to call your dad that night if he wasn't there when you're there, right? Right. So you grew up with that. That was part of your upbringing. And so, yeah, you could still had to learn when you got on tour and ask yourself questions to deal with it. But you've been dealing with it your whole life. I think the one person you could look at probably that handled it better than anybody we've been around is Tiger Woods and what happened with him. And I think it all starts with a strong self-belief that you have to always believe that you're a great player. You may not be playing good right now, but, you're, but you're, your belief is that you have the talent. And you think about Tiger Woods' dad, Earl, what he, he was already telling Tiger when he was two years old that he was going to be the best in the world. You tell him somebody like that over and over, they're going to believe you. The, the next part is situational training. As you guys both mentioned, you know, to be in that moment 
Uh, you have to experience it and experience it, learn from it. Well, well Tiger's dad, Earl, was was uh, special ops, special forces in the military, and they do tons of situational training. That's what their foundation, the bedrock of their training, is situational training. My pilot buddy, same thing. So he put Tiger, constantly put Tiger under pressure, constantly over and over and over, but never to the point of berating his self-image or his belief. And then then you take look at Tiger in his teens, and um, and he was working with uh, Dr. Uh, the, the psychologist, who was a military psychologist, It'll come to me in a second. Anyway, he's working with him and he hypnotized him and he worked on Tiger's um, imagination and visualization and relaxation under hypnosis. And he did those things with him and he caddied for him a little bit. But he was a military uh, psychologist. So he also had that military background that fit in with Earl. And the final piece of Tiger's puzzle was his mom. His mom was uh, Asian and taught him how to meditate and how he could take all that in and then meditate and work on relaxation with those same sort of things. And I think for me, that's how you train it. I think Tiger is the model. I mean, he's not, there's some things, if you go back, you can find online, some interviews he did back when he first came on tour that are really telling. Uh, as he got, went on, he, he would share with us less and less about what he did. But at first he really did. And there's a couple, uh, there's a video I'll share with you guys when we get done that is phenomenal that you will see those components in, at play. So, Phil, do you think that this is something that has to be nurtured over a long period of time? Obviously, greatness like that has to be. But, like, take a mini tour player that is still trying to figure it out. You know, how do you get him? Or, or even, you know, again, we got a lot of 10, 15 handicaps at home <laughs> playing in their club championship. You know, how do we eliminate all golf swing issues or mechanical issues, throw them to the side? How do we get them? That's one thing we talk about mindset a ton on here and how's great at talking about, you know, the, the importance of the mindset one shot at a time and all those stuff. But, but how, what, what's your advice? Like, how do you, how do you, for guys that are playing once or twice a week and they've got a tournament coming up, how do they get in that, in that moment and, 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 you know, stick, stick to the present and don't let themselves get result oriented. Well, there's, there's different layers. I think it starts. One way to start is to understand concentration is a skill that separates players. Um, confidence is the most powerful feeling you can have, but confidence comes and goes like the wind. You can, you can be feeling as confident as the wind was the world, and you step up on the 18th tee at the players with the wind blowing left, right. Hal, are you very confident in that situation? You have to go around that lake and the wind from the left, right? I mean, from the left, it will steal that confidence in a heartbeat. So concentration, and Nicholas talked about the power of concentration. And concentration is taking thoughts, which are words, and pictures, which are visualization, and feels, and combining them into a subconscious feel when you play the shot, because you can't think consciously. So you have to, once you get over the ball, you got to feel the shot. You got to remember the shot before you hit it. And then all you're doing is you're just replaying a memory and just copying a memory that you have in your head, because you've hit that shot before. And so it starts with the concentration. Uh, the other part is, is, um, is all about how you evaluate it. It's human nature to evaluate results. If you hit a bad shot, you're going to go, oh, and you start beating yourself up. It's okay to get mad. But if you beat yourself up to the point that it, you mentally injure yourself, your, paras your, your sympathetic nervous system is a fight or flight part of your body that doesn't want to allow you to get hurt. And if you, last time you hit a fiver in this situation, you hurt yourself mentally, your mind's going to go, wait a minute, last time we were here, that hurt. I don't know if we want to do this again. So it becomes that much harder to unclutter the mind and that much harder to relax and that much harder to play the shot. So when you evaluate a shot at the end, very importantly, you evaluate it based on how you went through your process, how you played the shot. Did you handle yourself and concentrate the way you wanted to? And if you did, that's all you can ask of yourself. And then you pat yourself on the on the rear and you say, hey, great job. On the other hand, if you lost concentration or you got you got out of your process, then you kick yourself in the head and say, listen, let's do a little better job with that the next time. And so I think it starts with that. And one other thing I'd like to add real quick is green light, red light. You make a list. You think back when you played your best. How, how did you feel when you shot 61 there at BC? What did you feel when you won the players at Riviera? What did you feel? I mean, not the players, but the PGA. What did you feel when you won the players? coming down the stretch. What did you feel? What did it feel like before the shots? What were you talking in between shots? Were you, were you looking ahead? Were you looking behind everything you can about how you felt? And that's all the green lights. 
And you think about the times where you struggled. What were you thinking about? Maybe you had more swing thoughts. Maybe you walked faster. Maybe you didn't talk to anybody. Maybe you got hanged on. Maybe you got technical. Um, those are your red lights. And then you simply say, when you're playing, you got to be self-aware and you start seeing those red lights start popping in your head. You got to say, okay, time out. I got to get rid of those and get back to my green light list. And you'd be amazed at when you simply identify the two sides, it's an eye opener and it becomes a lot easier. That's a lot wow. to turn into two, two, two minutes. That was strong. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, what you're really saying is there's self-talk and the self-talk has to be right. Absolutely. And, you know, so you were talking a lot there about a lot of things there, but I, I had a lot of self-talk going on all the time. And if it was something negative, I immediately went to something positive. I didn't let it linger. I didn't compound the thought with another thought of negativeness. And, you know, uh, I always said there was an angel on this shoulder and a devil on this shoulder. And they were both talking at the same time. So the truth is, if I could quieten the devil, then the angel had a, a chance to win. And, you know, Charles Kemp, who I refer to a lot, he was a psychology professor at TCU, wrote a book called Smart Golf. At the conclu he interviewed all the old great players. And the conclusion at the end of the book was they played with quiet minds. So your mind is quietest whenever the angel is talking. Because they're just putting something positive into your head. It, negative is just pounding in you. And you can't hardly get rid of it once it sets in. No, that's that's perfectly said. That self-talk is huge. And a lot of a lot of kids growing up today don't self-talk. Uh, my wife coached at Texas A&M Corpus Christi Division One women's team. And I helped out with the, her team. And, and I asked them on a few occasions, hey, you know, what are you saying to yourself? You know, when you're getting ready to play the shot or over the ball, what, what do you, what's your self talk? And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? We don't talk to ourselves. Yeah, I'm like, and so one, and so I agree with that 100%. There's, there's two components that, that get in the way. You said you play the shot freely, that, that, that you, you have a quiet mind. Two things interfere with your mind one is emotion, and the other is having technical thoughts in your golf swing. By the time you get up and hit it, you've got to have a memory and a feel which is subconscious and quiet, not words to say, okay, do this, take it here, take it there, do this, do that. If you're using words, you got a busy mind. That'll never work. It's got to right. be, a, you just see it and feel it, and you're just going to let it go. That's a quiet mind. And the other one's emotions. You need to feed emotions with, with self-talk. With There's other tools that you can, you can use as well. And when you have your green light, red light, you have something to self-talk to yourself about. Um, Azinger gave me a thing one time, and he and I both had memorized the, the quote from Theodore Roosevelt, the man in the arena, that ends, so that your place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. What a, what a great line. And I had it written on the inside of my cap. I'd write it on the inside of my cap and remember that. And that was the mindset I wanted to have going into every shot that I hit. And Say that one more time. Say that quote. <clears throat> so that your place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat, meaning they're afraid to put themselves out there. Because right. you put yourself out there and it, and it doesn't work, it hurts. Yeah. You know, there's a pain associated with that, but you got to want to keep putting yourself there because the, the feeling that you have when you succeed is so fantastic. Yeah. So one of the things that keeps people from doing that is they're never really willing to commit because if they commit to something, then if they don't do it, they fail and they don't want to fail. So if they don't commit to anything, they never really fail. Well, you can't win that way either. You can't. So tell you a story, Mike Malaska, who was a PGA teacher of the year a few years ago. Uh, Mike was a very good player. He missed Q school by one or two shots, like six times. Uh, really, really accomplished player and been trying to get help him with his mindset. And finally, one day, I got it to click for him. He was a downhill skier growing up, a really good downhill skier. He lived in Utah. And I said, Mike, you're, you're, and he raced. He was a racer. I said, so you're at the gate. You're getting ready, whatever it is. You're getting ready to go. Um, are you nervous? He says, yeah, you're, yeah, sure you're nervous. You're going to be going down this mountain at, at 70 miles an hour. I said, are you focused? 
Well, yeah, I see your focus, but it's not on technical things like how to turn. You just have this overall great sense of awareness of everything around you and your body and how it's moving. And it's just an awareness. And, and I said, OK, I said, are oh, you afraid? You're going 70 miles an hour down this hill. You're afraid. He says, no. He said, you know, my dad taught me. I used to come home from ski school when I was growing up. He'd say, you know, how'd you do that? I did really good. If I said I didn't fall. He would say, well, you didn't learn anything because you don't learn anything unless you fall, which is the same as what you're saying, how you don't learn unless you fail. He says, right. so, so no, there was, you just get used to falling as part of it. That's just part of it. So you're not afraid of falling. You have this awareness. And I said, Mike, you ever play golf like that? Well, no, how could I do that? And I said, well, sit, sir, just sit, sit down wherever you are. And I want you to close your eyes. And take however long it takes you to take yourself and pretend like you're sitting there at the top of a ski slope ready to go and make your field self feel that same way. And so we were on the phone together. And so he did it. And about a minute later, he comes back, says, OK, I feel pretty much like that. I said, so it took you one minute to do it. You've never tried to do it before. I said, if you did it for six weeks, if you practice doing that for six weeks, do you think you could do it quicker than a minute? Yeah, without a doubt. I said, well, there you go. Now you're playing golf. Now you're creating the mindset that you want to have. Self-talk, visualization, just like you're talking about, Hal. Yeah. One of the things, Phil, that you mentioned, and, and Hal and I say this a lot, you know, you never really fail at golf. You either win or you learn. And that's exactly, right. that's exactly what you were saying. One of the things I want to touch on a little bit that I thought you, that you said that I thought was brilliant, and we talk about this a lot here, is post-shot evaluation. Um, you know, I played Division one golf, played the mini tours, chased it for, for seven or eight years. And I was horrible at this. Um, I, al I always blame my golf swing. Sounds like you and I were very, very similar. Always blame, blame golf swing. And after spending two weeks with Hal, I realized really quickly, like, man, my, my commitment to the shot was just, was just horrible. And, and 75, 80% of the time, it was a commitment issue. It was a mindset issue and it wasn't, it wasn't a golf swing issue. Um, you know, talk a little bit about how we evaluate, you know, post-shot results. It's hugely important. And I struggled, Chase, with it, too. I was terrible with that. That was probably my biggest downfall. I spent all my time learning to deal with the pressure. And the stuff I tried to deal with, frustration never worked. And I, I never really had a good handle on it. And I think I have a better handle on it now. And I think I could do better. And it starts with what I said earlier is that, is, is, is human nature to evaluate. So to expect yourself to hit a shot and to say, okay, that's good. Here we go. That isn't going to work because you're going to evaluate. So it's all right. If we're going to evaluate, how can we evaluate in a positive way? Well, if we, if we evaluate based on, for me, the routine, the process is, is that you, first thing you do is you get up there and you assess the shot, everything about the shot, you strategically make a decision, you pull a club. The next part of it is you ha who the player who feels best is going to play best. And so you have to emotionally feel good. You want a quiet mind when you hit it. You've got to emotionally be in the right place. Red light, red, red list, green list. And so you do what you got to do. Self-talk yourself to make yourself feel like I can't wait to hit this shot. This shot might turn out great. It doesn't mean you don't mean you're telling yourself this is going to turn out great, but it's going to be this might turn out great. Right. Hal Sutton, be the club today. <laughs> he didn't know if it was going to be the club. It was the chance that it was going to be the club, right? This right. might be the club. An this opportunity. Might be a six iron might be the perfect club here. Basically, okay. an opportunity for greatness, right? This That's is right. An to, to be great, yeah. And so, hence that that line from that quote. You know, since your place shall never be with those cold and timid souls. Same thing. I want to feel a certain way. So now, the second part of my routine, self talk. I make myself feel good. Body language. I breathe. I relax. How do I want to feel? The third part is, now I, I see the shot. Everybody concentrates differently. Do you concentrate on a target? Do you concentrate on a flight? Do you just have an overall sense of the feel, not broken down into parts, just an overall sense of the swing, a feel for the swing? Do you tie those together, pictures, words, um, feels? You tie them together until you have, you have a feel of you can feel this shot before you hit it. I've already hit it before i'm going to hit a draw five iron back there i've hit a draw five iron before i know what it feels like it feels like this yeah, i know what it feels like okay now i got my i feel good about it i've strategically made my decision and i got a memory of playing this shot now i'm just going to sit in there with a nice quiet mind and i'm going to freely with optimism i'm going to let this thing go i'm going to let it go and then if i do that and i maintain my concentration on that feel all the way to my finish then i'm happy 
In fact, I'm proud. If I hit it in the water on the 17th with the players on the 71st hole with a one-shot lead, and I did that, then I'm proud. I don't beat myself up. And I walk away finishing third, and I'm okay with it. On the other hand, if I go, you friggin' dog, you suck, you can't hit a shot, which I did the next year in the last group with Faldo Saturday and Sunday and finished second the next year, I did that. The result of that was I lost my card the only time in my career until right at the end after t- beating myself up like that for a year and a half. So the tr- it's a choice. How you evaluate is a choice. And you make a concerted effort to evaluate on the process. What's my, did I do my process the way I wanted? If I didn't, then fine, get mad at yourself. Say you choking dog, or you whatever you're going to call yourself. We're going to get back into our process. We're going to control every element of it. If on the other hand, I did everything I wanted and I was, I did that. I don't care where the ball goes. You have to say, you know, you did what you could do. Bad shots are part of the game. Everybody hits bad shots. I don't care who you are. Go on, get mad for a minute say, and then go on, get over it. It's okay. So Phil, would you say, uh, that when you were playing your best, <clears throat> it took you about the same amount of time on every shot to play the shot? No. No? I'm with, I'm with Nicholas on that. and it, that, That's different than what everybody else says. Everybody wants – to me, when you try to have the same amount of time on every shot, you're trying to create – I can see where it works. You're creating a situational thing where the importance of the moment doesn't interfere with what you're trying to do. You're able to avoid um, anything too significant getting in the way. But on the other hand, I've trained myself. Patrick Harrington said, when you're nervous before the shot, you play your best because uh, you're, you're able to take the nervousness and create concentration. When you're at your worst, you're calm before the shot and you become nervous over the ball. It's a great quote. I trained myself the more important the shot was, the better for me. I wanted it to be more important because that was more energy for me to channel my focus into concentra- relaxed concentration. And so if I was play- when I played my best, I, the, part, the second part of that, creating the feeling that you want to have, um, if I was already in it, boom, you just go right through it. It doesn't take any time at all. I was not a slow player. But on the other hand, if I... If I'm a little bit, if I'm a little nervous about this shot, give me a minute to self-talk myself and kick myself in the rear and get myself in the mindset that I want to have. And sometimes, so because of that, some shots take may take longer or shorter than others. I want to be ready when I get in there, go through my process and be ready rather than avoid um, avoid the moment by trying to take the same time every every time. Well, I don't know that I had an exact answer that I thought was right when I asked you that question. I was just asking what you did. I tended to be the other way. I tended to have a process that I went through and I I basically did the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I was a fast player, if you if you recall. I mean I made my decisions and I executed basically. I, I didn't really want to give myself a lot of time to let the devil take over. Right. <laughs> Well, I trained myself, these visualization routines I went through, I put the devil on my shoulder and I talked to him. I became, I wasn't afraid of the devil. And I I know what you're saying. I admired you greatly because we played different games. You hit the ball so much better than I did. And you were so determined. You were so focused. And it didn't take you any time to get in there because your self-belief and your confidence on most times, you lost your confidence in your game off and on during your career, but you never lost your belief. And once you got in contention, your belief took over where confidence, where there was no confidence, your belief took the place of that. And because that's why you didn't take any time. Me, on the other hand, I played 16 years on tour. I never finished in the top 155 in fairways hit at a time where you needed to hit some fairways. I only finished the top 125 in greens regulation twice and, um, and was able to play 16 years. So my confidence was out there. I didn't have any in my ball striking. But my determination and spirit took the place of that. That's that's interesting that you said belief, uh, because that's a fact. I lost my card in uh, 93, I think. And we're sitting in the Las Vegas parking lot. And my dad said, well, you ought to go back to the school. I said, go back to the school. There's no way I'm going back to the school. I said, I'm a better player than that. I said, I've got, I'm top 25 money winners of all time. I'll use that exemption. And if I can't make it on that, then I'll find something else to do. So there's your belief right there. Chase. 
Mm. Chase, you see that facial expression? You see those eyes when he started talking about that? Yep. That's the Hal Sutton I know right there. That's the Hal I know. That's the competitor. That's the part of him that he takes for granted that a lot of people don't have. Because for him, he developed that growing up, and that's innate to who he is. And so often when people have special skills, they think everybody has those special skills. They don't appreciate them as much. Hal, right there, you saw Hal Sutton when he's competing. Sure. I, and uh, over the I last- should have tried to hide that. <laughs> And, and Phil, over the last four or five years, knowing how and being up close and, and personal with him, I've, I've seen it a few times. Um, my question is, again, I, my mindset goes to a coach from a coaching standpoint, right? Like to me, I think this is where as, as coaches and as sports psychologists, we could really mess a Hal Sutton up or a Phil Blackmar up because Phil, you, you figured out what worked for you. And, and going back to the pre-shot, the timing of the pre-shot routine. When I caddied for Hal, I was blown away by how, how fast he made decisions. Like, I felt like I, I couldn't. The first round, I was like, I can't keep up. Like, I, you know, this is he's going so fast. But then you are going to take a little bit more time and stuff. And I think if a sports psychologist has a set way, like, you have to do it this way to be great. Like, that's that's where, to me, coaching fails. Like, you got to figure out. Hal's got to figure out and had and figured out what worked for him. You figured out what worked for you. And then our goal is to nurture it and make it even better. So can I throw something along those lines out yeah. there about that? I think that I agree with you 100%. Everybody's different. You know, Dustin Johnson can't compete like Tiger Woods. Every, everybody's different. <clears throat> Slings are different. Minds are different. So how do you coach someone to find their way? And Hogan, there's actually a quote. I don't have it at my fingertips here, but there's a quote that Hogan had in, in Five Fundamentals, the Five Lessons. We talked about his process that he went through finding his swing, how he tried this, experimented with that, and did this until he find he found a, ser- a series of fundamentals which worked for him because they stood up under pressure and they stood up in all kinds of weather and they accomplished a specific goal, which for him was to not hit the ball to the left. That process, the, as for me as as a teacher, the way you teach that is Socratically. Socratic means to ask questions. And so as an instructor, you try to guide your student down this path of discovery where you ask them questions, but you keep them within certain boundaries because you got to stay within certain boundaries. You can only deviate from the norm so far. You stay within the boundaries, but you say, okay, what, what did you feel when you hit that shot? What did you feel here? What did you feel when you came those last five holes yesterday? What did you feel the last five holes last week? And you get them thinking about it. You, and you get them thinking about these things and feeling it. You'd be amazed how many kids can't tell the difference when they hit a shot. They don't know where it went. You know, one thing when I was teaching more, I, w- I would take my hat and, and I'd say, okay, go ahead and hit one. And they'd hit one and I'd hold my hat in front of their face where they couldn't see and say, where did it go? I go, I don't know. What do you think? Way left. No, I hit it to the right. You know, and so their awareness is not there. When you ask questions, you start asking questions. What did you feel here? What did you feel there? What was the difference between that one and this one? What did you feel? What did you feel before that? What did you feel before that? All of a sudden, you can maybe get them to do the things that you were going to tell them to do in the first place. But now they've uncovered it for themselves. If they uncover it for themselves, then they can become who they need to be. Hal, thoughts? Phil, that's pretty uh, insightful. Uh, You know, I mentioned earlier, I've said it many, many times. The answer is not in the answer. The answer is in the question. And, you know, I I don't think enough people ask themselves enough questions. And sometimes it takes someone else to ask the question. I agree that you don't. There are boundaries. you got to stay within those boundaries. You want to kind of get them to go where you want them to go with their own thoughts, which is what you're basically saying. That's exactly right. That's, that's exactly right. And I think if you go back how to our era and before, that's how players develop. The players on tour came up that way. Um, I know that um, somebody, I can't remember who, but I asked Weisskopf one. It might have been me. I might have asked him. I said, you know, what, did you ever work with anybody on your swing? He said, no. He said, I would. I would have somebody, if they had something they wanted me to try, I'd say, okay, give me give me a week to go mess with it, and I'll let you know if I like it or not. And so they would just take an idea and then go mess with it and ask himself questions, hit shots, and do stuff, and find out whether or not he thought it might help or not. 
I'm, I'm a firm believer that when you make changes in a golf swing, that a, a decent player, not a tour level player, but you know, a 10 handicapper or less, in five balls, you can tell if that's something that might help or not. You won't have it mastered. You may, won't be able to repeat it. But there's a difference between something that feels uncomfortable in a good way and something that feels uncomfortable like it doesn't fit. And I, I think that I think we don't give students enough um, per, enough um, accolades that they can actually make that decision. We don't have enough belief in their ability to make that decision sometimes. And we get it. And maybe they don't. You got to coach them through it and ask them a lot of questions to get them to that point, right? So I've got a question for you. You just made me think of it. When you were working on your golf swing, you said you never really had confidence in the way you hit the ball or anything else. And I know you worked with some different people. I'm sure you did. I didn't. I don't know for sure, but I'm sure you did. Uh, did you turn it over to them when you went in, or did you question what they were telling you? I turned it over for the most part. Um, I was always guilty of not doing it 100%, but I did. I worked with Ledbetter starting off to the end of my second year. Uh, for about a year and a half and, and I struggled and um, Watson asked me a question at the memorial one year I was doing a drill walking down the fairway and right to shooting 82 and and Tom said uh, he said what are you working on I said, I'm working with David Ledbetter and um, who I really like David don't get me wrong I like David a lot David and I get along great nothing, David had nothing but good intentions for me in trying to help me um, but I think what he had me trying to do didn't fit me. And I was doing this drill. I said, I'm working with David. He says, well, you might want to go home and look at some video and see how many really good players do what you're trying to do. And I did. And I went, well, okay, not very many. <laughs> and um, so, but I made, I made it the, the big area of my career. I worked with several instructors. And what I would do is I got to a point where I had enough money to keep my card for a while. I would get an instructor and I start working on my swing. Then I get on the golf course playing golf swing. And there's a difference between the shot creating the swing and the swing creating the shot. If you see the shot, you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the club to make that shot happen. That shot's creating the swing. On the other hand, if you get there and say, I want to make a swing so that it hits this shot, that's the other way. And I would start playing golf swing. And I would play like play terribly. And then when my back got up against the wall, I said, screw everything. Find a way to get it in the hole. And I get it in the hole and I keep my car to do something. I go back to working on something again. And I wasn't smart enough to realize this thing kept repeating itself over and over and over. And I should have just, just, just found a way to get it in the hole my whole career. But I, but I wasted a lot of time trying to improve my golf swing because I thought my swing had to get better. When I don't, I don't necessarily know that it did. I think I needed to practice in a different way and I needed to prepare in a different way. Well, along those lines, you know, people come in here and we've got all the technology and everything else in here. and They've got in their mind a set path that they want it to be and, you know, the right path. That's what they preconceived idea. And I'll look at them. I mean, I had a guy in here earlier today, you know, and I, he said, what do you think it ought to be? I said, we're looking for what you need to be. I mean, I'm looking for that right now. I don't know what that is. And it's obvious you don't know what it is, you know. I don't think, I mean, technology gives us data and there are people that play really well with certain data that doesn't necessarily fit everybody. And we all know that. If I, I know you know. If I could inject yeah. one second. The type of data you have now where you have impact related data is different from the data I had when you and I were playing on tour. We didn't have that. We had video. And so we would hit, we would try to make a swing with video that looked a certain way with the hopes that if we took it back this way and we got to this position and we started down this way, then then the path and, and whatnot would be good. As opposed to the data that you have now, where you have you you can sit there and see what the club is doing relative to the ball and the path and, and the face and all those sort of things. And that's different. That's a whole different set of data because you might you want to see a certain shot doing this and you let your swing evolve around that data. I I like that kind of data. I think that's a different way about it. We were trying to make our swings look a certain way with the theory that, well, if it looked good enough, then it would be more repeatable. And I'll tell you the one thing that made me realize that was I was following uh, Jordan Spieth and Adam Scott and Dustin Johnson one day at the Bridgestone doing TV. And on the 12th hole of the par three, Adam Scott got up and hit this beautiful seven iron right up there, 
five, six feet from the hole. And I sat on air. I said, wouldn't it be nice to jump inside his swing one time just to feel that swing? It is so pretty. Thinking that because it's so pretty, it's going to feel really good to us. And I got home that night or back to the hotel. And I'm thinking, you know what? If you put Jordan Spieth and Adam Scott swing, it probably wouldn't feel as good to him as his swing does. And if you put Dustin Johnson and Adam Scott swing, it probably wouldn't feel as good to him as his does either. Why is it do we think that if something looks good, it's going to be better? And all we had in our era was video. We we took pictures and made our swing look a certain way. Now you got you got um, flight data, you got impact data, you got all sorts of different things now. Well, we didn't even have good video. No, we didn't have that either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you couldn't even see where the club face was with the video that we have had then. Right. You know, Phil, I'm I'm way more on the new school side of 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 this discussion as far as the data and, and whatnot. What I've always told two things I've always kind of said to Hal was I don't think the data is much for the players as it is for the coaches. Mm -hmm. Um just because I mean, outside of Bryson, outside of a couple of those guys, like most of them, you know, we I used to work in the 3D world and we were shooting people up all over the place and putting sensors all over the body. And 90% of the tour pl tour players that we measured said, I don't want to see any numbers. I don't want to, I don't want to know any of this stuff. Send it to my coach. And then Bryson, my first time I ever met Bryson, it was at Colonial, his it was his second year on tour. And we met at Wednesday on the back of the range at like six o'clock. And he tees off at eight the next morning. And I suited him up, put him through it, and he wanted a full evaluation. Like he wanted to know everything. And I'm like, Bryson, I can't do that to you. You're going to, I mean, I'm, I'm going to blow you. And I didn't know him as, you know, at the time, you know, how he was, I'd heard stories, but he wanted to know everything. And so for me, I view the technology as I'm not ha like you, you view the, the video back in the day, like you guys were completely guessing. It's like, if I get my right elbow in this position, it's going to help my face to path and help me quit hitting it left. That was the guess. Sometimes you were right. Sometimes you were wrong. Where now we know that if you do these certain movements with the force plates in the ground, and then we measure and see, okay, it opened the face face a little bit, and now your pull turns into a little soft fade, you can you can play from there. But that's different. You're using force plates, which you can't see on video. You Correct. Can't, you, can tell, you can't tell what somebody's feet. And, have, and that's a great that's a great point because I love to have people hit balls barefoot to feel what their feet are doing. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing that I think the data helps us so much with is, and this is a perfect time to do it. Let's say you guys just got done playing, playing last week at the PJ tour event, playing great. You both finished top 10. You come in, we get all your data. Yeah. You come back from the Scottish open, you come back from the British open and you're like, man, I'm not hitting it quite as well. Hey, guess what? Spine tilt at address is 12 degrees different. Cause you've been playing in wind for two weeks. I agree with that a hundred percent too. And, and that's where I think, you know, I think it's up to the coaches to say, to answer the question that the players, the players come in with, what are they struggling with? Why are they pulling it? Why are they hitting it thin? Why are they hitting it heavy? Then we, we look to see if the data helps us answer that question. And if it doesn't, then it's like, okay, Hey, let's try a couple. Let's tweak your grip a little or tweak your setup a little bit or make some, make some educated guesses. But that's the thing. Like, I think, I think the state of golf instruction now is, light years ahead of where it was with you guys and how and i talk about this all the time like i mean the average instructor now is probably what some of the top five to ten instructors were back then as far as the amount of knowledge now you know it's hard to replace a harvey pinnock or some of the greats but at the same time we just don't have as many questions to answer as we used to we've got more factual information to help oh but there's more questions than you realize but i, I do agree 100 percent with what you're saying and basically what you're doing is you take somebody comes in and says why am i hitting left and you're going to look at that. You're going to look at the force plate data. You're going to look at their impact data. And back in the day, when I, what Hal, Hal and I were talking about, you would look at video. You'd go video them down the line and say, "Well, look, here's what your club face is doing. The club's getting a little bit behind you right here. The face is getting a little shut because you're guessing." So that's a whole different use of science. And so I, I agree with you 100. percent We're in a different place with science now than we used to be. And science is truly incredibly important and a great tool. I would like to see, the one thing I would like to see is more guys like Hal, more guys um, that, that played the tour, that were really good players. The, the player's voice has been lost in instruction. And there's still a place you might have, your data might be great. Your footwork and your, you know, everything about your swing might be great. And you go step up on that tee at the 18th at players 
with a one-shot lead or tied for the lead, what do you do now? And that's a question that only Hal Sutton can answer. That's a question that somebody who's been there can help you with. That's not a data question. That's how do you make yourself feel the way you want to feel? How do you make yourself commit to what it is you want to commit? Oof, there's some good stuff in that. Yeah. Feels like I said, he's smart and he uh, understands the game and uh, he's, you know, very much on the art side of the game. Uh, you know, he, he says he likes the science part of it, but every time I talk to him, <laughs> I wonder if he really does like the science part of it. And look, uh, you and I have had some some awesome conversations about the the art versus the science, and I, I still I will I will still say this. I think as guys that, like you that played at such a high level that this new technology and and for the a lot of the older coaches had this same kind of thought too, but either I don't need it or it's, it's going to change the game or it's, and, and I, I still think it helps us answer more questions than we could before. Obviously it does, but I still, I still say that it's more for the coach unless the player is Bryson DeChambeau. It's more for the coach to just like you do pick and choose one little area and say, fix this number. And, and, and it's going, it, all it, all it's really doing is, is applying a, a quantifiable number to a feel. Well, here's how I would say this. What little I play now, I think about my swing entirely too much. I never did before. And it's because I'm looking at this every day and thinking about it from a player's perspective. Yeah. I'm in the coach's seat right now instead of in the player's seat. But for every player out there, to have this available for their coach so that they can figure out what's best for them, which Phil talks a lot about in here, finding out who you are. Yeah. I think that's the best avenue to take. I think it has its place. If I, if I didn't think it had its place, Correct. we wouldn't be doing this. Correct. Yeah. So, um, he talked a lot about relaxed concentration. Yeah. It's pretty, you know, I've always heard, you know, a lot of the sports psychologists I talked to said, you know, you never wanted to be, you know, in a complete like trance, like, like you didn't want to be asleep. Right. Um, but you, you know, you also don't want to be geared up and wired to the max either. How did you? How did Hal Sutton get into that? Get into that state? Well, you know, when Phil was talking about that, I felt like I was in that all the time. I didn't feel like I ever drifted out of that. Um, I felt like I was more of an intense player, and I had to keep the intensity level up in order to sustain it. You know, I couldn't go in and out of it, and. Uh, but that was me. Did you feel like you ever had to calm down? I mean, we're there. I don't know if I've ever. Yeah. Oh yeah. I felt like I had to calm down. I mean, I've told you the story about whenever I started looking at the one little spot yeah. on the green, I felt like I, I can't win this tournament. If I don't learn how to calm down, I just couldn't calm down. It was more than intense. Yeah. It was like out of control. Yeah, anxiousness. Anxiousness. Like yeah. I mean, when, when someone says intense, that doesn't mean they're out of control. Yeah. That just means they're spot on did you how did you handle between shots so like when you felt like you were you know tiger players all that stuff when you were at your best did you kind of soften a little bit between shots did you relax and kind of see you know a lot of people talk about seeing you know seeing the trees and the birds and like kind of getting out of it yeah, i never you? was somebody like that really yeah. you know i stayed you know i'd look down or freddie might say something to me about something you know but it was like I said, I stayed in that intense yeah. moment as long as I could. This is probably a dumb question, but did you ever feel like you had to gear up? or were... No. Yeah. No, even Phil said a couple of times, did you see Hal's eyes? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's just who I am. I'm passionate and, yeah. you know, I'm intense. And, you know, I, my dad trained me to be that way. And I think, you know, Phil alluded to Tiger's dad training him to yeah. be a certain way, you know, and – Again, it's always tough for me to have these these conversations when you've got a three time, five time PJ Tour winner and a fourteen time PJ Tour winner. But like I, because I didn't play at that level, but I feel I, I when he said, "Man, kind of suck calling your dad after you played bad, didn't it?" And I was like, "Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks." Because I I hated that. Like I hated playing bad and missing a cut or or missing a qualifier in a, in a corn fair event or whatever web dot com event and calling dad and saying, "I, I you know I, I didn't play well." It just, I just that hit me like a ton of bricks. That, yeah, but. I think the good part about that is, Chase, we all hated it. Yeah. Right. I mean, you weren't in that by yourself. Yeah. You know, we all, you know, 
you cared. You know, you didn't want to disappoint your dad. You know, your dad had a major investment in it, not just in you, his son, but right. financially in every other way. Sure. And you cared enough about him. You wanted to play your best. The other thing I loved that we got into a little bit was this discussion that, you know, everyone's their own unique puzzle and mm -hmm. you figuring out, you know, because we, you know, and, and let's be honest, we were talking about pre-shot routine. You asked me the pre-shot routine, routine question. And I would definitely not, I would definitely say that we don't try and pigeonhole everybody into a, a set specific pre-shot routine every time. We're not trying to get them on 30 seconds every time or mm -hmm. whatever the number is. But at the same time, we want it to be, you know, fairly consistent. And, and it's it's mainly just getting a plan and having an idea of what the shots you're going to hit and then trying to execute and all that stuff. But I, I loved the, just the discussion that everybody's different. And Hal Sutton had to figure out what was best for Hal Sutton. And Phil had to fill out, figure out what was best for Phil. I have to figure out what's best for me. And and hopefully as, as we do this, we – we marry with a coach that can help do that and doesn't isn't going to pigeonhole us into a certain certain way yeah well you know one of the things that uh we talked about on there we talked about so much i'm having a hard time remembering it but you know we talked about uh finding your own way whatever that is right. and you know Phil had one way of doing it. I had another way of doing it. And, you know, I felt like there was an angel on this shoulder and a devil on this shoulder. And he said he got in a conversation with the devil. I didn't want to hear what the devil had to say, you know. And I tried I tried to limit the amount of time that I took because I didn't want a conversation with him. And anyway, uh Everybody's got to figure out what works best for them. I did ask him at one point in there, did you just – give in to everything everybody wanted you to do. Yeah. And I asked that question because I did that on occasion. Yeah. And you always ask everybody, what would you change? Here's what I would change. Never give in to everybody without having your own opinion and voicing your own opinion to whoever's trying to tell you this, yeah. whatever they're trying to tell you. Because here you've got to fully understand what they're trying to do or say to you why, and why you agree with that why are they making the change why are you you know why is the auto mechanic going to charge you a thousand bucks to fix your car right you know if you look at it like that and and to that point yeah like you know before i came before we joined together i had been kind of helping bryson a little right. bit you know kind of a, a consultant on his team you know and he really pushed me when i when i said hey bryson i think you need to do this it was like you're going to tell me from a physics standpoint why i'm going to do this and honestly how you were the same way like any time i said hey we need to get our arms a little deeper we need to turn more we need to do this it was like you're going to tell me why or i don't i'm not even going to try it and i was more, i was way more like phil like i to me it's like if if you have the shanks if you've got the chipping yips if you can't get the ball airborne you might have to let go and give give it over to a coach, right? right. But if you're Hal freaking Sutton walking in this door, Phil Blackmar, or a tour player, or or a scratch golfer, or a five handicap that's hitting it really good, or whatever it is, you have to have a strong filter. You have to because, you know, if if you if if you walk into if Hal walks into this this academy 25 years ago, and and I push you down a wrong uh, you know a wrong rabbit hole and you're desperate at the time and you try it i mean we could ruin your career we really could well one of the things that phil talked a lot about on there was belief and you know that's the one thing i never lost i lost confidence but i never lost belief in myself and i think the reason why i was able to have belief is because i had to have answers to why we were doing things that we were doing yep. because i had to take it out there and continue to believe in myself yep. and if i if i didn't understand it and i didn't know what i was trying to do then I'm not sure I could believe in it when I needed to. Yeah, and totally. No, I totally. And I, like I said, I've said this a bunch on here. I was, I was horrible at that. I really was. I, I thought every coach had every answer, and then I, I hit the brick wall, and they couldn't help me anymore, and I, I was just deflated. And then I had to reset and go try, you know, go try it again. And the one thing I like that you say and Phil said too, even when we were talking about Ledbetter, is you know all the coaches have great intentions. You know, no one's trying to, no one's trying trying to mess, to you, mess up. you up. You know, they're just they're just working with what they know and and applying it the best way they can. Well, and that's one thing I, I feel like. I mean, this is no offense to everybody that was out there teaching twenty five or thirty years ago. There was just no way to back up what they yeah. were saying, right. and that's the one thing that data has done. It's given teachers a backup. Yeah. And, you know, which 
turns into belief. Yep. We're just not guessing as much. We're not guessing. So hope you guys enjoyed episode one with Phil Blackmar. Uh, next week's episode is, is going to be really good as well. Uh, let's let's segue quickly. Um, we got a new. I hate to use the word product because it's not really a product, but a new venture that you're you're working on. You tell, tell them about it. Well, you know, you know, I've wanted to do this for a long time. It's called Let's Talk Golf, and um, before the pandemic set in, we were thinking about doing this in a conference room, basically, or in a big conference center where people came in. And we just had an open forum about the mindset of golf. Uh, So through all these Zoom meetings, because of the podcast and everything else, we've learned how to Zoom. So (laughs) we're fixing to (laughs) do (laughs) a a series, a season series of eight on Let's Talk Golf, and one of the the opening season, uh, the opening segment, episode one. Uh, episode one is about taking inventory of what you currently have. Let me tell you why that's important. It's important because if you're an older golfer, it's hard to make swing changes. It's hard for me to make a swing change. But where you can really make a change is understanding what you have and making good mental decisions with what you have. And that's what this is going to be about. And it's all about the mind. It's not really any about the swing. And hoping that we can help you become a better player through just the way you think. Well, one of the things you guys said, I'm going to backtrack to, the, to, the, to Phil's episode. One of the things you guys said that just kind of spurred me to this was that and this might be an episode too, but somebody made the comment. I think it was you made the comment that you you, you have almost have a better chance of improving your score by improving your middle game than 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 golf swing. And I would almost say that you can almost take golf swing out of this. There is not a player in the history of the game that could not get better by if they worked on their middle game and got, improved their middle game. Tiger Woods being the best wasn't perfect all the time. His his the devil spoke up at times and he didn't commit to the shot and all that stuff. So. This is, like you said, this isn't a golf swing class. This is a pretty much everything that Hal Sutton did on the golf course from a mental standpoint, you're going to teach it to the, to the people that sign up. We, uh, that's true. And you also get to ask questions about it. So this is interactive, and I, I will be responding to whatever your questions are. Uh, and it's, it, it's my opinion, you know. Other people differ with what they think. You know, Phil and I don't see, we just had that. We don't see exactly eye to eye on everything. But uh, what it's going to do is make you think about what you're thinking about. And I think that's the most important thing. One of the things that Phil and I talked about, it's the questions that you need to ask yourself. And I will prompt you in that. So that's going to be a, a way for you to get better at golf. Yeah. So real quick, what, you know, what is it? And you've described it. It's they're about an hour, hour and a half long zoom calls right? where people can get on, get on live with how they're all going to, if you sign up, they're all going to re recorded. So if you don't, if you can't get in there live, you can see the, see the recording after the fact, probably going to do most of them on Wednesday evenings, right? Might, might end up throwing one in on a Tuesday or Thursday, depending on the schedule, but most of them will be Wednesday evenings. Um, and you can get on there and ask the first one, like Hal said, is on taking inventory. What are your strengths and weaknesses? Are you honest with yourself about your abilities? And so, you know, Hal's going to talk about taking inventory and how he did it and how it applies to you. And then at the end, if you guys have any questions, you can, you're going to be able to be able to basically type it in, speak directly to Hal and he can, he can touch on anything you guys want to touch on. That cover it. That, that covers it. <laughs> we're we're excited about it. Um, it's first episode is July fourteenth, so it's so it's a week from today. Week, a week from, from today. Yep, yeah, July fourteenth. Um, and we're running a special right now. So the normal price is going to be uh, one ninety nine, and we're running fifty dollars off right now if you sign up early. So if you for you guys listening, interested in working on your mental game, go to offers.halsuttongolf.com. Again, that's offers.halsuttongolf.com. You guys go check it out. Again, as always, thanks for listening in. Oh, one more thing. We're also doing one more little special for you guys listening at home. This is just for our podcast guests. Anybody, so we're, I'm going to, you talked about the middle game. I'm going to segue. There you go. So if you guys need any swing help at all, we do online lessons. We talked about it. We offer them on housesetandgolf.com. But for our listeners, for the rest of the month of July, if you guys are interested in doing a, a, uh, an online lesson, normally they're 125 bucks. We're going to take $50 off. So if you want to get in and do one lesson with us, shoot us an email. We'll get you set up. It'll be seven. 25 bucks and Hal or myself or, or one of the members of our team will take care of you. So you got the mental help with Hal, the, the, one of the world's leading experts on mental game. 
You got the golf swing help from us in the academy. So if you guys need any help in the month of July, we're trying to get you all squared up, all squared up, all taken care of. So there's no excuses. I don't understand. I'm signing up. <laughs> right. Like why wouldn't you? Right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, as always, Hal, these are fun. Um, Phil, Phil was great. I love getting to talk to great players about their processes and their mindsets and how they do it a little differently than how you did it or how I tried to do it or all that stuff. So it's always, always good to learn something. Well, and Phil is going to be two segments. We need to say yeah, that there'll be another one. Next there'll week. be another one next week because he was so good. He kind of like Brandle. He's smart and he goes on. He's got an opinion. So if you like Brandles, you're going to like Phil's uh, too. So I love hearing everybody's opinion. We all did it a little different, and I think there's something to learn in that. Don't try to fit a mold at it all. Let's figure out who you are and let's be the best version of you, whoever that is. Amen. Thanks, guys. Be the right club today. Yes!